The esophagus leads to the stomach, which is an organ located in the upper left of the abdomen. The liver is on the upper right, stomach is on the upper left. Um, the stomach has kind of a characteristic J shape to it, and the stomach has some unusual characteristics compared to other organs. The stomach is extremely distensible. It can be distended quite a bit. It can be stretched out um, depending on how much food we eat in a meal. And um, on top of just being able to, to accommodate all of that food, at the same time, it's still able to um, maintain muscular contractions. It can still churn the food, which helps to mix the food with gastric secretions. Uh, we're gonna be seeing a little bit of what, what are some of the secretions the stomach produces. Hydrochloric acid is one of the secretions that the stomach can produce. So the churning action of the stomach that really helps to mix the food with hydrochloric acid. As far as digestion is concerned, the stomach initiates the process of protein digestion. So proteins, this is a really key place for proteins to start being digested. And um, in addition to that, the HCL, the hydrochloric acid that is produced by the stomach, also happens to kill off a lot of the bacteria that we might ingest with our food. So it has some immune activity in that sense. The food, once it has been churned and mixed by the stomach, uh, it's now called chyme, that's this word right here, chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. Chyme is the product, uh, the, the food, the form of food that then moves along into the small intestine. So let's just look at this layout of the stomach. We've said the esophagus, that's the tube that leads down to the stomach. Esophagus leads into the stomach. The stomach has a few different areas. This top section is called the fundus. And then the main body is called the body. And then this lower region, the distal end, is called the pyloric region. Um, at this distal end, there is another, another sphincter. This is called the pyloric sphincter valve. And this is what, what provides a separation between the stomach and the small intestine. The duodenum is the first section of the small intestine. We'll be getting to that next. That's the next organ. Um, so inside of the stomach, we can see in this picture just the, the, all the layers of muscles. There are muscles running in many different directions. And again, that allows the stomach to churn the food. We also have on the inner lining, we have some interesting structures. So if you look at the inside surface of the stomach, there are all of these folds. Those are called rugae, rugae, rugae depends on who you ask how to pronounce it, rugae. Um, rugae are the sites where, if we were to zoom in on a rugae and look inside of it, there are these pits, and those pits are where a lot of the secretory cells are located at. So we're gonna be zooming in on some of those gastric pits, which are located in these folds of the stomach. So on to the gastric pits. The gastric pits, okay, so we're looking right here, this is the inside surface of the stomach, we can see all the rugae. And if we follow one of those folds down, right, here's a big pit. Uh, we're just gonna zoom in on one of those pits. So the gastric pits house a whole bunch of cells. These are epithelial cells. They're cells lining the surface. And a few of these are, are very specialized to secrete specific substances. So the cells we're gonna focus in on are named right here. Um, we're gonna start with the mucus cell. Mucus cells or mucus neck cells. These are the cells that produce mucus. And mucus, we've mentioned it a couple of times before. Mucus is important for just uh, providing lubrication for food to be able to move, but it's also extremely important in the stomach um, just for protecting the lining of the stomach. The conditions inside the stomach are very harsh with, with all the HCl, all the acid that's present, and the mucus that is produced by these cells really helps to protect the integrity of the stomach itself so that the stomach doesn't digest itself from the inside out. So mucus neck cells, um, then we've got parietal cells. Parietal cells are the ones that produce acid. They secrete HCl. They also secrete some substances that help later on with vitamin B12 absorption, later on in the small intestine. We'll come back to that. And then finally, we've got the chief cells. The chief cells are very key for allowing protein digestion to take place in the stomach. So those chief cells, they secrete a molecule called pepsinogen. This is a precursor for an enzyme, pepsin. And pepsinogen is the inactive form. So these chief cells secrete the inactive form of the enzyme, and then they will become activated. We'll see this in, in a couple of minutes. Okay, so three key 
secretory types of cells. In addition to that, the stomach also has cells that secrete hormones. So hormones that go into circulation in the bloodstream and then those help to regulate things like hunger. A good example of this is ghrelin. Ghrelin is a hormone that travels to the brain and modifies our, our, um, our feeling of hunger. Usually ghrelin levels are, are high right before a meal and then they drop after a meal when we feel not hungry anymore. So ghrelin is thought to be a key hormone in signaling uh, hunger. Let's focus in on the parietal cells. These are the cells that are secreting HCl, hydrochloric acid. We, were, we need to learn how they do this. These are very specialized cells. All right, most organs are not just spewing out hydrochloric acid all of the time. So what are these cells actually doing? These cells, the parietal cells, they have two different surfaces. They have an apical surface. The apical surface is the side that's facing the lumen of the stomach, so that's the side that the food would be located on. And they also have a basal side, a basal lateral side. This is the side that faces the capillaries that are right around the stomach. So these two different surfaces are specialized. They have different uh, different proteins embedded in them. Remember that in the gastrointestinal tract, adjacent cells have tight junctions, and that's really important for allowing this specialization. If we didn't have tight junctions between these cells, then what would happen? The enzymes and the proteins embedded here, they would just diffuse over to this membrane. They would try and spread out by diffusion. So it's very key that, for one, we have tight junctions between neighbor cells, and um, as a consequence of that, we can have this sort of specialization. So what is the specialization that's going on here? Let's start on the lumen side, the side facing the lumen of the stomach. What we have embedded in the parietal cell membrane right here is we have a pump. This is an ATPase. That just means it is a pump that uses ATP as an energy source. So it's going to use some ATP to do its job. What it's going to pump or transport is two things. It's going to pump protons, so hydrogen ions, it's going to pump those out of the cell, and at the same time it's transporting potassium ions into the cell. So we have antiport going on. Um, two different ions moving in two different directions. They're sort of like trading places. Okay, with, the, with regards to the protons that are getting transported, this transport is up a huge concentration gradient. There's a lot of of um, hydrogen ions already out in this space, and perhaps there's not very much on this side. So to transport hydrogen up its concentration gradient, this is like transporting it against a concentration gradient of a million to one. It's a huge concentration gradient. So that definitely requires energy in order to do that. Okay, so ATP is necessary for this. And that potassium that is transported into the cell then diffuses back out of the cell through a potassium channel. So its concentration it sort of equalizes. Potassium gets recycled. It travels back out to the outside of the cell and can be reused um, to power, help power the transport of protons out into the lumen. So um, where do these protons come from? Let's come inside of the cell here and look at what's going on right here in the middle. So all cells produce carbon dioxide. That's just a byproduct of cellular metabolism, cellular respiration. Um, so what happens here is the carbon dioxide that is produced combines with water, which is present in all cells, and there's an enzyme here that facilitates this combination, carbonic anhydrase. This is one we've met before. This was uh, the enzyme that produces um, bicarbonate, right, which is the major buffer in blood. So what happens is carbon dioxide and water produce carbonic acid. The proton from that carbonic acid, that's one of the protons that we can then pump into the lumen of the stomach. Okay, so that's where the, the proton comes from. The rest of the molecule, the bicarbonate ion, it is transported out of the cell into, um, into, the, into the blood. So that goes and contributes to the buffering system in the blood. The transport of carbonic acid, that's being transported down its concentration gradient, that is used to power the transport of chloride ions into the cell. So now what's chloride going to do? As it builds up inside of the cell, it will diffuse out and be transported by facilitated diffusion, so no energy required, just needs a, a channel to allow it to pass. Um, chloride will be transported 
by facilitated diffusion into the lumen as well. So the net result of all of this is that we've taken protons, pumped them out, and we've also taken some chloride and transported out. The combination of those two is HCl, hydrochloric acid.